I'm excited this morning. The presence of the Lord is here. And I want you to receive the word that he has given. I have been given the task today of preaching to you, and you can keep standing for just a minute, on marriage, on divorce, and on family. You say, Amy, those are tough subjects. Yes, but they're also a path to victory in our lives and in our society. And we have to remember the truth of God's word when it comes to marriage. I got so tickled yesterday when, uh, I, you know I had to mention this for pastor when Tennessee beat Auburn I'll just go ahead and throw it out there because I knew pastor wasn't going to be here today and I couldn't believe he was going to miss gloating over this but secondly I started thinking about a post I saw recently that said if you're a single person and you're looking for a mate find yourself a Tennessee fan because they'll stick with you no matter what and always be faithful because here's what I've learned there's good times and there's bad times there's winning seasons and there's losing seasons but if we can make a little small commitment to a football team if we can stick with that football team through all the ups and downs of when you think you're coming out of the season but you don't and you're still losing when you lose when you you're not supposed to lose and you win when you're not supposed to win and I can still put on a Tennessee Jersey on Jersey Day and I can still walk into this house and say go balls then we should be just actually more much more committed to the man or woman that God gave us in marriage and I believe that today now I want you to listen to me I am not here this morning to judge you I am only assigned to preach what I see in the Word of God the truth that he's given there I, I have been a little anxious over this sermon because in no way would I want to offend you or hurt you but I believe that as we preach truth from the Word of God that's not to hurt you that is to help you and to help your families and to help your marriages so I want you to look with me first in Ecclesiastes 5 4 through 6 it reads I have two portions of Scripture I want to read you First from Ecclesiastes and secondly from Mark 10. That's where we're going next. But Ecclesiastes 5, 4 through 6. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vows. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple messenger saying, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the works of your hands? Mark 10, 6 through 9. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Will you pray with me? God, I come to you this morning and I ask you to anoint your word that it will be powerful and effective in speaking truth for kingdom advancement that people will be encouraged and not discouraged. God, that you are for them and you're not against them. God, that you are a God who will fight for our marriages, fight for our children, fight for our families, and fight for our future generations. And you have called us to be faithful to you and to one another. And God, I thank you for what will come about because of this word today, let it be powerful and effective. 
because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit and use me as your vessel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. Now, as I speak on this today, I understand that there is a re array of realities in this room. There are those who are married. There are those who are single but would like to be married one day. There are those of you who are divorced. There are those of you who are divorced and remarried. There are those of you who are separated. And there are those of you who are contemplating it. But there is an array of people in this room today and I understand that. The reality of having to be biblically centered and at the same time compassionate and merciful is heavy upon me. We cannot let compassion keep us from the truth, but we also need to speak the truth in love. And that's what I wanna to do today. See, divorce has become the norm of our day. Here are some statistics for you about divorce. Every 13 seconds, someone somewhere files for a divorce. 66% of divorces are filed by women. 4% of people in the military file for divorce each year. 50% of children in the U.S. will see their parents divorce in their lifetime. 43% of children in the U.S. are living without their father involved in their lives. 41% of first time marriages end in divorce. 60% of second marriages end in divorce. 73% of third marriages end in divorce. And the average first marriage lasts eight years. Now the good news for you is that the statistic used to be 50% of marriages end in divorce. But now they're accurately saying probably more like 42 to 45% of marriages will end in divorce in the US. And the main factor for that percentage dropping is that fewer people are getting married in the US, opting for cohabitation or remaining single. Also, younger couples are getting married later, presumably when they're more mature. So those are the statistics. Now, again, I am not up here today to be your judge or to make you feel badly for something in your past. I am not here to point out anybody's situation. I don't have anybody's name listed as case in point. I am up here because we have had several people write in that during this You Asked For It series, they would like marriage, divorce, and family spoken about. I am up here because there is an all-out attack on our marriages and on our families. Our enemy has a very determined agenda and destroying your marriage is high on his list of things to do. Don't fool yourself. It is not just a battle over you and your wife. It's about your children and your children's children. And too many believers are losing this battle not because it can't be won, but because they cannot see the path to victory. The good news is that for every marriage killer and for, for every mountain that you face and the enemy builds against you to discourage you and to defeat you, God stands ready to protect you and to fight for you. And I am so thankful for my God. The first thing I want us to see today is that marriage was God's idea. The first book of the Bible begins with a wedding in the Garden of Eden, that of Adam and Eve. The Bible says two are better than one. And God said to Adam in, this, in the garden in Genesis 2, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Men, that's us. Don't get all excited. We're the helper. Healthy marriages are still the way that God builds his church and exerts his influence over a lost and dying world. You need to know that God has a purpose for your marriage. 
and he has a vested interest in seeing your marriage succeed. Marriage is not easy. Can I get an amen? It is not something to be committed to on a whim or without much thought. Marriage is not a test run. We cannot go into marriage with the idea that if it doesn't work out, I'll just get a divorce. Pastor and I went into marriage with the decree that divorce is not an option. They should be showing you a picture of these two beautiful young people. And I hope you see that Pastor really did have hair when I married him. Better or worse. Better or worse. No, just kidding. That is our wedding picture. And when you go into marriage with the, de with the decree that divorce is not an option, that reality changes everything, especially the way you end an argument. When you can make that kind of commitment, then compromising, forgiving, and reconciling are not optional. We made a vow before God, before our family, and before our friends. God did not design this covenant, which is a synonym for vow, for you to play house and hope for the best. It takes work. It takes sacrifice. It takes crucifying the flesh. Can I get an amen? Forgiveness, mercy, reconciliation, and total commitment. God could not be clearer about the commitment of marriage in the Bible. In Malachi chapter 2, and we'll talk about this later, it says he hates divorce. It's that simple. Jesus tells us that outside of adultery, physical abuse, or abandonment, we are called to stick it out for better or worse. A committed and lasting marriage demands a made-up mind. If you're going to make it in your marriage, you have to learn some secrets for outlasting the tough seasons. I want to give you four keys to loving your spouse through tough seasons. The first key is you have to go through the valley together. See, when we go through a season of trouble, we do not grab our toothbrushes, head out the door, and call it quits. We reach over and take each other hand and we keep going after God. Even in the toughest seasons of marriage, God will always open a door of hope, no matter how bad it gets. I do not care how many demons you're fighting. I do not care how much sin is coming to your home. There is still hope, and there is still a door of hope in every valley of your marital trouble. It typically takes the first nine to 17 years for people to die to their self. Did you hear me? That is why the highest percentage of divorces occur during those first nine years of marriage. You have to determine that you are going to stick it out even the good days and the bad days. You are there till death do we part. Second key is you need to go deeper. The only way any of us are going to hold it together in life with each other is to go deeper and deeper into Jesus. Grow in your faith as a couple. Pray together, read the Bible together, worship together. Jesus is still the answer. Whatever is troubling your marriage, he can handle it. Jesus is the only foundation that can cure your life, your home, your marriage and your family against the inevitable tides. No other foundation will stand. That's why it's important that God is your foundation. If you'll put up the next slide for me on the pyramid. Pastor, when he does premarital counseling, he always shows this diagram. And what you see here is you and your spouse and at the very top, God. And pastor always says, the more you go toward God, what are you doing? You're getting closer to each other. I am a testimony of that today. My husband and I married when we were, uh, he was still in college and I had just gotten out of college. I, he will tell you this, I'm not telling him, we had some maturing to do. 
We still had some selfishness in us. But I will tell you as a testimony that the closer we went to God, the more we went after him, the more we fell in love with Jesus, the more we fell in love with each other. See, when I went to premarital counseling, the counselor told me, he said, he looked at Kevin and I said, you think you love each other now? It will be nothing compared to how you'll love each other in 20 years. And I remember Kevin and I looking at each other and said, how in the world? You know, because we're so in love. But with time, with experience, with going through the struggle together, but most importantly, going deeper in the Lord, you can make it. You have to go deeper. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14, it says an important truth. If, if going toward God is what draws us closer together, then we need to understand this passage in the Bible. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? If you are still single in the room and you are not married, you need to make this your theme for dating. Because here's the problem. Anytime children of God marry children of the devil, they're going to have trouble with their father-in-law. Don't hook up with someone who doesn't share your faith because there's always going to be a conflict of gods in your home. You don't need that struggle. So if you're not married and you're single, live by that. As you draw closer to God, it will make a difference in your marriage and your family. The, second, the third key is believe in your destiny as a couple. You're going somewhere. You're not there yet, but you're going somewhere. Every marriage goes through the delight stage and every marriage goes through the disillusionment stage. But if you will hold on and keep loving one another, if you will lead in forgiveness and humility and honesty, and you will eventually move from the delight stage through the disillusionment phase to the ultimate destiny phase of your marriage. When God is truly at the center, destiny is attached to it. The destiny of your marriage today is at stake. The destiny of your children's future is at stake. The destiny of God's purpose for your life is at stake. The commitment I make and honoring my marriage vow will always be connected to my destiny. Fourth key, don't give up. If you're going through a challenging time, if you're wondering if you'll ever love your spouse the same way again, hold on. If you do not give up, and if you will work on your marriage, God will meet you there and he will make a way even when there seems to be no way. That's the kind of God I serve. Don't give up on your spouse. Don't give up on your marriage. God has big plans for you and the one you married. Dream together again. Believe together. You're on the same team. This isn't a competition. You're one. When Kevin wins, I win. When I win, he wins. And Kevin and I, Pastor and I, we like to win. If you don't know that about us. Our bloodline, our bloodline church is Jesus Christ. So we have winner's blood pumping through our veins. Don't give up. And the second point today that we're going to talk about is the marriage covenant. What does that look like to us? Malachi 2, 13 through 16, should be on your screen, says this. Here is another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows that you and your wife made when you were young. But you have been unfaithful to her. 
though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To, vo- to divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. Pretty strong passage in the Bible. See, in this passage, Malachi, he's just going to lay the truth out there. He is seeking to tell you God's view of marriage. He is not seeking to be politically, politically correct. He is not seeking to win friends or to be popular. He simply wants the truth to be told according to God. Marriage is a spiritual issue. I'm going to let that rest right there. Marriage is a spiritual issue. God is saying this in Malachi. You come into the church singing. You come into the church praising. You come into the church giving. You come into the church prophesying, yet at the same time divorcing. He says you profane the sanctuary. You are dirtying up God's house. Now he is speaking of illegitimate divorces. Matthew 19, 9 says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So there are legitimate reasons, but he is speaking of illegitimate reasons. Now the man is the one being addressed in this passage. Now that's not real popular in our society, but God always starts with the man. All through the Bible. Not that the woman has no part or doesn't have fault or doesn't have things she needs to get straight because we do. But God always starts with the man because he is the one responsible. He tells the man in this passage of the Bible that he will cut this man off. He is saying he cannot have a relationship with a man that is illegitimately profaning his sanctuary. These people looked like they were spiritual They were crying, they were moaning, and they were groaning before God. But the passage says God is upset with these illegitimate divorces and remarriages that are taking place in the church and that the priests were not even addressing it. They weren't even speaking to it. They were just allowing it to take place. What was the problem? You see the word at the end of verse 14? She is your companion and wife by covenant. God takes his covenant seriously. A covenant is a legally binding relationship in the spiritual realm that God has. I'm going to say that again. A covenant is a legally binding relationship in the spiritual realm that God has. That being so, Covenants can never function as they were intended to function without the overarching governance of God. When God's viewpoint and his authority are dismissed from the marital covenantal relationship, it becomes an open door for Satan to bring destruction into your home. Marriage is a sacred covenant and not just a social contract. God operates by the rules of his covenant. He says, she is your wife by covenant. Now, a covenant is not there to make you happy. Happiness is the result, not the purpose. If happiness is the purpose, you will be miserable. And when you are no longer happy, you'll want to trade that car in. The purpose of God's covenant is to always expand his kingdom. And when he made Adam and Eve, he said, let them rule. Let them be fruitful and multiply. 
if you get stuck on happy, Satan has you because he knows how to make you unhappy. Can I get an amen? But if you start with covenant, you end up with happy. Most people don't start with covenant. The purpose of marriage is the relational expansion of the purposes of God in history of which he calls seeking a godly offspring. He wants you to have children to raise up as godly seed who spring out and spread the image of God worldwide. Happiness comes off the purpose of the covenant being fulfilled. If you're stuck at happy and never get around to covenant, the happy will die. Happy is not a strong enough anchor to hold the purpose for which the covenant was established. It's a covenant. And covenants were designed to expand God's purpose in history. Now hang with me. This is tough. I'm telling you. It was tough when I was studying it. And I I was troubled a little bit in my spirit. But I had to speak the truth. Will you listen to me and stay with me? The first ingredient of a covenant is that it is overseen by God. He sits over it. He transcends it. Why do you need to know that? God said, let not man put asunder what I have joined together. How do you go to church for me to marry you, but go to the judge to decree you divorced? What you just did is tell man that he gets to overrule me. You have interfered with my covenant. You are saying the judge is more powerful and more important than God because you are allowing him to cancel what God okayed. You want God to marry you and man to separate you. We want God to bless the marriage but not bless the divorce. Now you get couples who say, I don't believe God brought us together. But that's not what you were saying when you got married. In fact, God says in verse 14, because God has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. You brought me in on the front side, but you left me out on the back end. The second aspect of covenant is chain of command. Please stay with me because I'm going to get to a better part in a minute. The second aspect of the covenant is chain of command. All covenants have an order. Problem is we don't like order. 1 Corinthians 11, 3, the head of every man is Christ. That's easy, amen. The head of woman is man. Now we're going to get quiet. And the head of Christ is God. And children are under the parents. There is an order. Submission on some level. I want you to listen to me. When you break the order, you jack up the covenant. The covenant disintegrates in its effectiveness. Do you know why Satan went to the woman in the Garden of Eden? He wanted to flip the roles. That was no mistake. When you leave your lane, you're headed for a crash. Now that isn't popular theology in this day and time. I know that. I know that, but it's truth. Thirdly, there were rules of the covenant, governing guidelines, love and respect. A man is supposed to love and a woman is to hold the man in high esteem, which is respect. He's supposed to massage her heart and she is supposed to massage his head. The end of Ephesians 5 says, men, love your wife as you love yourself. Wife, respect your husband. Now, women, I understand that is real easy when they're loving you like Christ loved the church. And a lot harder when they're not. Same thing for men. When a woman's showing you respect and being what she needs to be, it's a lot easier to show that love than when they're not. Everything falls under this. When these two things are functioning... Men, love your wife as you love yourself and wife, respect your husband under God, of course. Then harmony becomes normal and not abnormal. Now, I want to tell you something. Pastor is my covering 
as a woman minister. And I have no problem saying that. Why? He is the head of my household. I respect his role as a priest of my home. Now understand this. This order works very effectively because pastor does love me as he loves himself. Men, how do you do that? Know who you are in Christ. I believe the breakdown we're having here is we're not even loving ourselves. Why are we not loving ourselves? Because we don't have our identity right. If we have our identity right, we realize that everything we are is because of Christ and he's what says we're all that. So first off, we got to get the identity issue right. So that we can love your wife as you love yourself. Secondly, women, you need to show respect. Therefore, I know that Kevin has my best interest at heart. I know that. This makes it easier for me to hold him in high esteem. We are not a threat to each other because we are on the same team. We are for one another. And that's how that covenant works. See, you can have a satisfying or an unsatisfying marriage based on whether or not you are reflecting the image of God that you were made in. The health of the home is determined by whether or not the man is reflecting God and his character accurately in his role and whether or not the woman is reflecting God and his character accurately in her role. Every time there is a marital breakdown, one or both partners is no longer living a life that reflects the rulership of God through them. I'm gonna say that again. Every time there is a marital breakdown, one or both partners is no longer living life that reflects the rulership of God through them. Most of the negative realities present in our society today can be directly tied to the failure of marriages and families and their authenticity to reflect God's rule. Marriage is a divine covenant. Divorce is breaking that covenant. Only God can break it. When you break that covenant without a biblically based reason, there are consequences. And that's the situation that Malachi is giving reference to in this text. Man has taken God's covenant and tried to belittle it, ignore it, or destroy it. The enemy has people believing that we can break God's covenant without any consequences. The marriage covenant is the means for transferring blessing. Deuteronomy 28 talks about the blessings of keeping God's word. And then he goes on to tell of the curses that come for those who do not follow God's word. Attached to God's covenant is the blessing. God hates divorce because it's a covenant issue. A quit issue is not built into a godly covenant marriage. It is for better or worse. Sickness and in health, richer or poorer, till death do you part. And the church should do everything possible to fight against divorce. To stop it, to mediate it, and to do whatever it can to pray against the attack of the enemy on our marriages. Pastor and I are taking this very seriously. In fact, in February, February 22nd and 23rd, we plan on having a marriage weekend right here at this building where you can come and have child care and we can just have a weekend together of building our marriages. We're in a fight, church. We're in a battle. And we've got to do something about it as a church to stand and proclaim the truth of God to help people in these times that we're living in. The third thing that I want to talk to you today is about getting your fight on. We give up too easy. Do we serve God or do we not? Did we say we serve a God who all things are possible with him? That nothing is too difficult for him? Then we've got to fight. So in Nehemiah 4, 13 through 14, it says this. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, 
spears, and bows. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. I say that to you, church. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Nehemiah is a high-ranking official in a foreign country who God calls to return to his homeland and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. We've spoken about this before. The city was a mess. It was in ruins from countless battles to destroy her. Nehemiah gathered together the leadership of Israel and he set to work. Enemies were coming to destroy the Israelites' homes, their marriages, and their families. But Nehemiah was not afraid. He told the people, do not fear. Remember who your God is. It is obvious that the attack of Satan in the 21st century is on our home. The values that we cherish and the godly principles that we have dedicated ourselves to are worth fighting for. Can I get an amen? If you want to win your families, we must do one thing. We must fight for them. And I love the picture the Bible paints of Nehemiah's construction project. Nehemiah 4, 15 through 18. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked, while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding their weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. You better keep the sword belted to your side. The trumpeteer stayed with me to sound the alarm. These men were building and battling at the same time. They had a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other. We live in a time when we must build up our family with one hand and fight the enemy with the other hand. When Nehemiah endeavored to rebuild walls that had been torn down, immediate opposition rose against him. Don't you think the enemy's going to give you a tough time in your home? Don't you think the enemy's going to give you an easy time with your marriage, with your children? He is here to steal, kill, and destroy. But God said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Is your family under attack? Decide today that you're not going to let the enemy have your family. Determine to fight. Remind yourself of what's important. Take responsibility for your family. Determine to not let hell destroy you or the ones you love. Determine to not let them perish. Get a sword in one hand and say, I'm going to rebuild and I'm going to fight until I get the victory back in my house. And here's the good news, God will fight for you. If you're determined to keep your family together, if you're determined to reconcile relationships that are broken, to leave a godly legacy through your children, to love and forgive the way God loves and forgives you, you better start fighting. You can't claim ignorance because I just told you. The enemy is out to get our homes. He's out to get our children. He's out to get our marriages. We have to rise up, church, and fight. So you need to get a battle plan ready. You ready for your battle plan? Here it is. First one. Take some time to access, uh, to assess the spiritual condition of your home. Assess the spiritual condition of your home. No family's perfect. Stress tension and conflict are common to all. Your family environment is not always going to be saturated with smiles, laughter, and hugs. But Jesus needs to be the center of it all. If you're going to be victorious in the fight for your family, it's time for you to take responsibility. I want you to think about these questions. Have you compromised your activities? Have you compromised in who you hang out with? Have work, going out after work, 
TV or video games become more important than spending time with God? Are you having conversations with friends that turn into gossip fest? Do you tolerate rebellion? Is discipline non-existent in your home? Do you allow your kids to go to parties or sleepovers without verifying that a parent is present? Are you searching things on the internet that you know you shouldn't? Are you watching things that you know you shouldn't watch? Are you speaking blessings or curses over your family? Do addictions fester in your home? Do you wrestle with unforgiveness? Does alcohol or any other substance, illegal, prescription or otherwise, have power over you? Set a standard in your home. Get rid of filth and foul talk. Be watchful of what is going on with your kids. Allow God to cleanse your spirit and set you free. Allow him to remove the bitterness and replace it with joy. Allow him to remove the anger and replace it with peace. Allow him to remove the contempt and replace it with love. God can take a family torn apart and put it back together again. He is the God of second chances. I challenge you to anoint your home with oil and let the Holy Spirit know he has a place there. Mother and father, you need the Holy Spirit because he's going to let you know when things are off with your kids. How many of you ever had to have those come to Jesus meetings? Yeah. I've had to sit my kids down before and say, listen, there is no way that your father and I will go out and speak the word of God and try to win this world and lose you. I will not have it. So I need the spirit of God as my checker. You understand what I'm saying? And when I get this uneasy feeling and I get it, I get it. My kids know I get it. Then I have to sit down and say, what's going on? Are, are we doing the right things? How, what are our friends doing? I have to check this. You need the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your home. Secondly, you need to speak blessing over your home. There is life and death and the power of your tongue. And then you need to pray together as a family. You've heard the saying, a family that prays together. Yeah. Next battle plan, you need to commit to your commitments. If you want peace in your home, if you're going to have a long-lasting marriage, if you want generations of family to continue to serve the Lord, then commit your paths to God. Don't let culture define or influence or identify your values or your family. Stop flirting with sin. Stop okaying what, 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 what wasn't okay when you were being raised up, but now you think it's okay to bring into your home and nothing's going to happen. Stop flirting with sin. Don't see how close to the line you can get. See how close you can get to God and see how he'll bless your home. As you raise your family, set on your heart that you and your loved ones will be committed. You will go to church together. It's not an option. You will read the Bible together. You will be a God-honoring family. Commit to the promises you made to your family and don't just talk about it, do it. Your kids have heard your words for a long time. Your spouse has heard your words for a long time. But your actions speak much louder than your words. Third part of the battle plan, live by your convictions. We must be determined to not allow spiritual compromise to enter our house. We must identify things in our lives and our families that do not glorify God. And then we must remove them from our homes. Don't keep entertaining them. Don't keep letting them in the door. We don't do this for uh, the sake of saying we've got rules. We do it to fiercely protect those that we love. This is how we create a spiritual, spiritual heritage. This is how we pass down the garment of faith. It takes strong mothers, it takes strong fathers, it takes courageous men and women who are willing to say yes to God and consecrate themselves 
their families and their homes. I am tired of the enemy getting into your homes because you're cracking the door. We got to go back to a standard of holiness, church, not to put anybody in bondage, but to protect. Because what you start off allowing in that seems small is going to grow bigger with your kids. And then it's going to grow bigger with your grandkids. Trust me, I've seen it lived out. Shut the door on it. Don't even entertain it. And the last part of the battle plan is fight for what's left. Fight for what's left. God is still the God of what's left. You may not feel this to be true, but if you hold on to your faith, God is going to use the rubble, the tears, and the heartache for a greater purpose. If you are hurt, weighed down by trouble, or struggling with conflict in your family, it's not over. Hear me again. It's not over. You may not have what you used to, and your life may look different, but you're not finished. If you still have an ear to hear and a leg to stand on, you can stand on God's word. You can find hope in the promise that though your beginnings were small, yet your latter end would increase abundantly. When hell tried to disseminate your relationships with your loved ones, it is easy for us to step back and just let the bulldozers come in and topple that wall of what's barely left standing. You stand up and you fight for what's left. You may look at your family today and see a war ravaged home. Fight for what's left. You may be still hurting from a divorce that you are desperately uh, hurt by and tried to stop. Fight for what's left. If one of your children is away from God and you feel like there's no hope, fight for what's left. If a senseless tragedy has tried to steal all hope in your heart, fight for what's left. Did you know that the walls Nehemiah built are still standing today? This is how important it is to fight for your family. You must fight. You must pray. You must fast and keep doing it over and over again. If you do not give up on your family, your walls will stand for generations. Fight for what's left and God will fight for you. I challenge you, husband and wife, talk again. Pray again, try again, forgive again, reach out again, go to dinner again, refuse to give up, refuse to allow depression and worry and anxiety and frustration to overcome you. Fill your valley with prayer, fill your valley with praise, fill your valley with the scripture and fight with God's word. God has not destined for your marriage or your family to stay in conflict. He is not destined for relationships to be broken. He has destined you for reconciliation. God has destined you for victory over your marriage and your family. God's will is for your family to unite. He wants to break down walls that have caused division. He wants to reconcile differences. God is calling you to a place greater than where you are right now. And the miracle is not found in what was lost. The miracle is found in what you've got left. Fight for it, fight for it. Can I tell you, when I fight for my marriage, I'm not just fighting for Kevin and Amy to be happy. I'm fine because I have three children. This is my baby right here on the front row. I want to leave her a legacy that her mother and father loved each other. That they respected each other. That they cared about one another. When she gets ready to find a spouse, I want her to find one that tells her how beautiful she is. I want her to find someone that that compliments her talents and abilities. I want her to find someone that builds her up and doesn't tear her down. Why? Because my husband has set that example. He does so much better than even I do. My husband, I will tell you this if you don't know, but he is a builder up. I think God just knew I needed somebody like that. But he is an affirmer. That's what he does in our home. 
it drives Kendall crazy sometimes because he'll try to be affirming to me in front of her to set an example. And she'll say, Dad, quit. That's gross. He said, no, Kendall, I want you to see this because then you know what you need to be looking for. Church, we need healthy families. We need healthy families in our church. We can do more from the kingdom of God when we're functioning together. Now I understand that there are people in this room, you've already been divorced, it's done. The past is the past. But let's get on track today, church. And let's fight to keep our marriages together, to keep our children following after God, to set an example for them that they can hand down from generation to generation to generation. I was reading a story in the Bible recently that really stuck out to me, and I wish I remembered that, to write the name down. But when Jeremiah, when things were falling apart for, that, for Jerusalem and for Judah and God told him to go to a certain man, I wish I could think of his name, and to, from a, tri, a tribe of people and bring him in. And God said, this man's ancestors made a covenant to me. You ready for this? That they would not drink alcohol. They wouldn't drink wine. That's in the Bible. And that they would live in tents, I believe it was. And he said, they have kept this covenant to me through all this time they have not broken that covenant because they were protecting their families and he brought this man from that tribe in and he said to him because you have been faithful to the covenant that you have made to me there will always be one of your descendants fulfilling the call of God in their life through generations and generations I want that for my kids I want that for my grandchildren. I want that you can't just live in now because it isn't all about you. That's part of our problem in society. We've made it all about us. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than that. Let's fight again. Will you stand with me? Before we can pray together as a family, I want you to do this. I want you to bow your heads. If you're here today and you say, I do not have a relationship with the Lord because it starts there. If you didn't get anything else I said, it's where when we're walking in the right covenant with God, that's the whole breakdown in our homes. Can I just tell you that? We give him tokens. We give him enough to say that we're believers, but we're not all in. It's got to start with both of you, husband and wife, mother and father, children, committing yourselves back to the Lord, wholehearted commitment, setting a standard for your lives. If you're here today and you say, Amy, I don't have a right relationship with the Lord and I know that affects everything around me. And I want to give my life completely back to God, either for the first time or as a rededication because I know it starts with me. I know it starts with me. If you're here today and you say, I need to recommit, I need to commit myself back to God, will you raise your hand? Just raise it, yes, all over this building. I need to commit myself back to God, yes. I need to commit to Him the right way. I need to make Him the Lord of it all. Yes, thank you. Anybody else, yes, thank you. Four or five hands going up, anybody else? saying I need to give my life completely to God listen young person before you ever go into marriage you better make that commitment it's tough enough without him with him excuse me without him I don't even know how people do it I want everybody in this building to pray this prayer for me and I want you to mean it today I don't care if you've been in the church for 20 years I want you to recommit today I, I, I want you to do this and I can't make you to make God the center of your families again. That everything's based around Him and not just a little token you give Him every once in a while. Will you pray with me, dear Heavenly Father? I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. All my sin. 
God, I want you to be the Lord. I want you to be the Lord of everything. Of everything in my life. In my life. I want you to be the Lord of my marriage. I want you to be the Lord of my marriage. The Lord of my family. The Lord of my family. The Lord of my home. The Lord of my home. Help me, God. Help me, God. To get rid. Of the sinful things, of the sinful things that I've allowed to come in, that I've allowed to come in. They may seem small now. They may seem small now. But they will cause destruction. But they will cause destruction. And God, I commit. And God, I commit to follow you. To follow you with my whole heart. With my whole heart. And now I confess you. Now I confess you as Lord and Savior. As Lord and Savior of my life. Of my life. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to have you on my team. To have you on my team. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Amen. And amen. Now I want you to look at me. Let's clap. Amen. amen. At least 5 people raise their hand. Now I want you to listen to me. That's a start. Okay? We start with him first. Cuz that makes everything else flow right. Okay, now secondly, this is what I want us to do today. If you just accepted the Lord as Christ, I will have people stationed on either side for you to come down and speak to them, to get a Bible, to get some things placed in your hands, a form of commitment. Secondly, I want us to make this sanctuary an altar of families today. When I prayed about this, this is what I felt in my spirit. Now, this is gonna be hard for some of you because you may not have family in the room. We're gonna handle that. Just give me a second. If you are here in this room today and you have anybody from your family in the room, I want all of you to get together somewhere across this room. If you are a single adult and you have no family, I want you to join with another family that you know or feel comfortable with. Okay, hear me. But I want everybody to group up. We're all the family of God. So if you don't have a family member here, you do have family members here. It's us. I want everybody, and this is what we're going to do, church. I just felt to do this. We're going to get together with our tribe, with our family, and mother and father, starting with the dad. We're going to pray together. We're going to speak blessing. And we're going to commit our homes back to God. Okay, I don't care where you go. You come to the altar area, you can spread out in the back. I want you to get with your families. And for just a few minutes, I want us to spend time praying over our families. Will you help me do that? Get to move right now. Get with your families, wherever they are. Wherever they are. Again, single adults, get with a family that you know or a friend. to make this an altar this morning of praying blessing and help to our families. Will you help me do that, God, in the name of Jesus? God, I pray over every family represented in this house today. God, I'm asking you to restore broken relationships. God, I'm asking you to allow forgiveness to take place in people's heart. There are wounded people in this room. There are broken people in this room and they need the touch of the Holy Spirit to come in and to help them to forgive, to help them to move past their hurt, to move past their guilt, to move past their hardship, to move past the sin that has tripped them up. God, I speak blessings over our families. God, I speak blessings over the men in this room today, God, that they will be mighty warriors and that they will rise up and be the spiritual leaders of their home, that they will lead according to the way you ordained in the Word of God, that they will know you, that they will love their wives as Christ loved the church, that they will commit themselves to you, and that they will be the first one in the household, God, to lead the others to you. Secondly, I pray for the women in this room. God, help us. Help our attitudes. Help us, God, when we think a little too highly of ourselves. We are not called to rule over men. We are called to be under the authority you 
set up in your word. And God, I'm asking you to help us to lead the way you want us to lead, to lead our families the way you want us to lead our families, to lead our spouses the way you want us to lead our spouses with love and respect and humility. God, help us to join together as a team. Help us, God, to pick up our sword and fight and push back everything the enemy has thrown at us. Help us to move forward, God, together because we are better together. We are better when we're working and looking out for each other. God, now I pray for our children from the youngest age up to our young adults. God, I'm asking you to move in the lives of our young people. They are our heritage. They are our destiny or that's coming after us to continue to fulfill and move the kingdom of God. God, I pray that you guard their minds. I pray that you guard their hearts. I pray that they will become hungry and thirsty for you. Not the things the world offers, God, but the water that is living where they'll never thirst again. God, give us that water. Set our children on fire for you, God. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Let them be the leaders that you call them to be. Let them use their talents and abilities the way you call them to, Lord. Let them walk in victory, not in addiction, not in strongholds, God, but in freedom. Give us freedom today, God. Give us freedom in our homes, freedom in our marriages, freedom in our spiritual world with you. God, we commit to you today. We recommit to fight for our families, to fight for our marriages, to fight for our children. We want you, God, to be the Lord of it all. The Lord of it all. We need you, Father. We need you, Father. Now I pray for every marriage in this room that is struggling. Where the enemy has come in and made you believe that it's over that there was no way it could be restored or healed. I bind the lies of the enemy in the name of Jesus. And I speak the word from my sword that all things are possible with God. He is our restorer. He is the lifter of our head. He is the one that brings dead things back to life. And he can and is willing to heal our marriages. God, let us love one another again the way you called us to love. Let us forgive one another the way you forgave us. Let us believe in one another again. Let us dream together. Let us plan together. Let us battle together, God, for kingdom advancement. I speak healing over this house. I speak healing over this house. I speak healing over this house. I speak healing. I speak healing over this house. I speak healing over this house. Revive us again, oh God. Revive us again, oh God. And raise us up, God. Because I believe your word is truth. It is life. I speak this in the name of Jesus. I speak this in the name of Jesus. Now I want you to look at your family and I want you to give them a great big hug. I don't care how much you fall before you got here this morning or how they made you mad. I want you to hug your family and tell them you love them. Speak a blessing over them. Amen. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to worship for just a minute, but I want to tell you something. I want you all to look at me. I love you. And I am never here to hurt you. But I am called to speak the truth. But the truth, remember, is to set us free, not to bind us. 
the truth will set us free. That's what the Word says. The truth, the truth will set you free. The truth has been spoken today. Now it's your responsibility, not mine, to do something with that truth. My heart has been broken in months past to see the enemy fighting our marriages and trying to divide our homes no more. I even called special prayer time with some of our prayer team have come in here and we begin to battle for your families because I will not sit back and let him destroy your homes without a fight. Why? Because your families are part of this church and when you're whole, we're whole. And when you're healthy, we're healthy. And I want that for you. God has greater ahead for you. He will lie to you and tell you there's no way good can come. It can. Because that's the kind of God I serve. It can. Stop seeing the negative. I'm, I'm challenging somebody here. I don't know who you are. Stop seeing the negative and begin to see the positive. Go back to why you married them in the first place. I told one group of ladies one time, if all you can come up with is the fact that they make a good living and support your home, start there. And start speaking life over the fact that they have a job and they support you. Instead of just the negative of what you don't like. Let's speak life to one another again. As much as you want to be built up, they want to be built up. As much as you want to be loved, they want to be loved. And I believe this with all my heart. If you will put God first. Listen to me, church. I can't get this across any more strongly than what I've already told you. If you'll put Him first, all these other things shall be added unto you. Stop trying to do it in your own ability and let God pursue God go after God and watch what he can do I bless you today please know my heart I bless you I bless you in the name of Jesus and after I dismiss if you want to come down and you need specific prayer I will stay and pray for you I do not mind if you have a family situation that needs specific prayer I will come down here and stay with you but I want you to leave here today encouraged that God is for you and not against you. And better days are ahead with Him. God, I ask protection over these people as they go home today. I ask protection over their minds, their spirits, and their bodies. And God, raise us up as a mighty army in this last day to accomplish the will that you set out from us, the destiny that you had for us from the beginning. We love you and we honor you today, God. Amen and amen.